Hi everyone, I'm glad that you are here at Humans of Authenticity. My name is Lily and I'll be your host. The Authentic Humans joining us today is Rodnika Scott and I look forward to these conversations. I first met Rodnika in Detroit where she shares something that has stayed with me ever since. The sentence was, whatever opportunities come your way, say yes because you are capable. At that point, I admire the trust that you have in yourself and your surroundings so much that you were able to say that. So I really thrilled to have you joining me and look forward to learning more about your experience and stories. Let's get to it. Rodnika, would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners first? I wanted to thank you for having me on your podcast. It's really exciting to be here. And like you mentioned, you can say something to someone and you don't realize the impact that it may have on them. So I'm just really appreciative for the universe of letting that have an impact on you. So again, my name is Renika Scott. I am a native of Georgia, which is in the southern portion of the United States. I uh, am the oldest of three kids. My father was in the military, the Navy to be specific. So when anyone asks me, where am I from? Because it doesn't always sound like you have a Southern accent. I would say somewhere between Georgia and California because we moved around quite a bit. The primary places that we were in was California and we would go to Georgia for the summers in that space. I have a brother and a sister. And moving around so much, you really get used to your family unit. You learn how to pick up and to grow and to engage with a variety of people from a variety of backgrounds really early on. It's also somewhat isolating. In the Navy, during the time that I was growing up, there were not many minorities and especially not many Black people that were in the officer space of the Navy. So it was very isolating, but you learn to adapt, you learn to adjust. A bit more about me, I am 6'3", you can't tell that on camera, but I am uh, in that space. Yes, I did play basketball. I played both at the University of Kansas and Arkansas State University, which are two major programs uh, in the Division I arena of basketball. My background is in journalism, public relations with a minor in history. I love both communications and I love to dig deep into what I call all of the nerdy stuff, understanding the history behind things, the reasons why, and why do we constantly repeat ourselves in so many different ways. So that is really my educational background. As I think about how did I get here in the Washington, D.C. area, after I finished grad school, I actually came to Washington, D.C. because I found out that I had a very rare heart condition and uh, it disrupted my basketball uh, playing career. I had to stop very abruptly. And I was told that if I did not have surgery to repair my condition, I would not live till 30. And there were only two places in the country who had the expertise to repair the condition. One of those was at the Mayo Clinic, like out uh, in the Midwest, and one of those was John Hopkins. And the individual at John Hopkins actually uh, had done very similar surgeries before. So that's how I ended up in the D.C. area. I met my husband about three weeks into living here, and we have built a wonderful life. I mean, full of adventure. I started off as an educator. I taught history and English literature. So those were my jams. I love working with kids. I love their quirkiness, uh, their honestness. I love, I really love engaging with people, even though I'm an introvert. So no one would tell you that I'm an introvert. They'll say, you're so outgoing. I am not. I've just learned to be outgoing in this space. I made a decision around that same time. And it was a very tough decision because my background was in journalism, public relations, and I had a master's in communications. I decided either I'm going to teach or I'm going to explore my training. And that is actually what led me into associations. At the time, I did not realize all the wonderful things that you could do with associations, but I took my first role 
at an organization called Teachers of English to Speakers of Other Languages. And that really is where it all started professionally. I was in membership and awards. I created our first social program. And uh, throughout my career, I've worked with mostly STEM and medical associations. That has grown to uh, spending a bit of time at a startup tech firm that worked for us with associations. And uh, now I'm at the National Society for Professional Engineers, where I'm the vice president of member and state engagement. What that means is that anything that engages our members, including uh, work the, working in ethics, education meetings, uh, membership, customer service, advocacy, all of those things are under the umbrella of what I consider the teams that I support in that way. And so wife, mother professional and for a good deal of time and I think I'm going to restart this journey it's I'm going to go back and be a coach at one point in time I coach basketball for kids ages oh four to 14 I coached six different teams in the same year and it was fun it was a stress reliever and kids make you laugh they are my joy I love your story so much. There were so many different elements that I want to unpack. I think we need another hour for that. So let's simplify it. Looking at the, the journey that you've had until today, what would be the three things that you love the most? Three things that I love the most. I will start off with my family. I love, and I know this is cliche, but I love my husband. I love how he balances me, how he is so calm and I can sometimes be excitable. He is so thoughtful and caring to every person that is around him. And I've learned and grown so much from that relationship. I have also loved being a mom. My son is everything that I wish I could have been as a kid. I, he is shy, but he is so thoughtful, so kind so smart, exciting, like it is a journey to be able to not only have a, a little human being, but to watch them grow and develop and watch them be brave on their own course and to see how they treat their peers. The biggest compliment that I had actually came from a very recent uh, parent-teacher conference where uh, one of his teachers stated that the teachers get together and they've talked about my son stating he is genuinely the kindest and most thoughtful child in his school. And they all see that in him. And that's not a testament to me because I can't say that I'm always as thoughtful and kind, but it's really a, a testament to God in that experience. Professionally, what I can say, uh, the, the biggest impact for me has been the association community. I will give you an example of the professional organization that I'm a part of, ASAE, which I'm sure many of your guests are a part of. I discovered this association. I saw this application online for the emerging leaders, professionals, and I decided I'm going to apply. This was back in, I believe, 2009, 2010, somewhere in that range. I applied. I got the recommendations on board. I was ended up accepted into the program. And what I was surrounded by was not only the association community, but 10 individuals that were in my cohort who were all young professionals who were striving to lead. It was the first time that I will say that I found a bit of a safe space. You have people coming from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of experiences, and Yet we merged, we synergized. And in my particular space, I found out shortly after joining the program that my husband and I were expecting our son. And it was really exciting, but I ended up very sick during pregnancy. So I could not engage with my cohort. What was beautiful about that is that although I could not engage like they could throughout the course of the program, they always included me. They always uh, gave words of encouragement. And that was my first sense of a true community. And it's something that I've carried with me throughout my career. So many of them are still friends today. And they really watched not only my career, we supported each other in different ways, but also watched my family grow 
over the years. And so that's beautiful to me. And I value that so much. I love how you start with your own stories before the professional size. And even we talk about the professional size, it's not about the positions. And I, I want to repeat another sentence you say that stick in my head. I really want to brag about this. So Ronica told me that anyone can have the same job title, but it is your own stories and your own upbrings that make you who you are. And sometimes we need to be vulnerable to open up and share that experience because it show our true self. And to be honest, that was one of the foundational blocks that I used to build this series. So and I want to say thank you for that. I can't wait. Let's get into the, the keyword discussion. So I gave you a list of 12 keywords to choose from. Which one did you select? I selected trust. Why did you select this word? So, you know, it, it's interesting. The, the podcast title is about being your authentic self. And yet when I saw the list of words, the first word that jumped out to me was trust. Because whether I am starting an interview, when I was dating it, my husband, that like those, that word came up at so much in, in the space that I was operating in. Even when I introduce myself to new teams and we speak about values, the first value that I always share is that it's the most important to me that I can trust you. And I start off giving trust. I trust you. And even if you mess up, if we're humans, I understand that. I just expect for you to share that something shifted, something changed, and we'll work on it together. I would say trust has been a pillar of my experience since being gosh, a little kid. I not only traveled with my parents, but I did spend some time with both of my grandmothers very early in my childhood and what they instilled in me is like honesty they instilled being yourself and that was the way that God made you be yourself and to rejoice in that and and I trusted them I believed them they even instilled in me that I think you're going to be a little tall remember that God built you this way and that you should celebrate it. You should accentuate the fact that you're tall and embrace that part about yourself. And a part of that, it was not just that I believe my grandparents, because there's so many people in my life that I believe what they say, but I trusted that they would not lead me astray. I trusted that whatever they were sharing or whatever they were not sharing was for the better good and the benefit. And I think trust is the foundation of communications. When you are engaging with a team, something that one of my mentors, a woman named Florence Freeman actually shared with me is that your teams, your teams will make you or break you. And at the time I understood, but I didn't quite understand the, the extent of what she meant. And I thought it really meant digging into the work every day and making sure that they were doing their jobs. That's what I thought it was. And the longer that I worked with people, the longer that I managed individuals, what I really realized that it meant is that if your team can trust you, if you provided a safe environment, if you're actively and openly communicating with them, you will be successful. You will not only want to make them successful, but they will want to make you successful and it will be a combined experience and a combined goal. So when I think of trust, I think of being vulnerable for wins, being vulnerable when it comes to mistakes and just having that open line of communication where I don't have to worry about title. I don't have to worry about uh, background and experience, but you can just bring yourself as yourself to any space particular part about bring yourself to any situation I understand that if there is not enough trust in the foundation we will show up with masks to protect ourselves it's basic human instincts right right how do you set up an environment so that when you enter that environment people will have that trust in you and trust in your style and in your way of conducting yourself it's interesting that you asked that question 
I would love to say that I don't know, but it's the feedback that I get so often. I just show up as myself because we're going through my career, going through the spaces that I've operated in, even when I think about coaching kids. So many times we all have an expectation of what a VP looks like or sounds like or dresses like. What does a coach look, sound, dress like? How you should show up in the world. And it may not be based on anything except for all of our own preconceived notions or things that other people have said or told us. I just try to show up as myself. A story that I have that I chuckle about is, is I call it a post-pandemic story. I have someone on my team that said, when you started, I noticed that you'll get on a Zoom and you have on a t-shirt. And I never, I actually only showed half of my face in most of my Zoom calls, not me, but the individual who I was speaking to. And I did notice that her face was always cut off in every single Zoom call. Yeah, and I, I didn't ask it to, you know, show up how you feel like showing up. And I started noticing again that she started showing more of herself and turning her camera on, being more engaging. Just in general conversation, she said, you know, but you showing up, you just had on a t-shirt. You didn't worry about fancy language and you just spoke to us like human beings. You laughed, you had fun. And I thought if she's the VP and she could show up in a t-shirt to the Zoom meeting, maybe I don't have to worry about what I'm wearing and how people are going to perceive me. It ended up getting us into a much deeper discussion about being judged and being afraid to show up how you are and how that gave this particular individual anxiety. And I told her, I like t-shirts and we're on Zoom, we're at home. I'm not paying for dry cleaning to sit on a Zoom <laughs> camera. And it was something that was so simple but at the same time, it's something that impacted her and it allowed her to show up in her workspace. You could see more of her personality coming out because she was willing to show herself, not just the physical self, but to laugh, to say the quirky things and to know that no one's judging you. We want to know who you are. You spend so much time here. I don't want the facade. I want to see you. I want to know about the facts that I have everyone on our team from people who love to ride horses, people who have been sommeliers, or to people who actually are active actors. And I want to know that. I want to get to know you as a person. So I just show up as myself and I invite those around me to do the same. I love how you challenge the visual perceptions of professionalism. I think the day of a full suit with a briefcase for a VP is long gone because now we have Mark Zuckerberg rocking up with T-shirts and jeans and Steve Jobs back in the day with the turtleneck tops. That was my classic dissemination of visual perception. They are all gone. If we show up as who we are, that's how we will be respected. You know... It's interesting that you say that. Y yes, and I think for especially women of color that operate in any professional space, there's always an underlying layer of pressure that if you don't show up in a space that is consistent with what I would call Western or show up in a space where you look professional, people will devalue your quality of work. People will question uh, your intelligence. And th there's so many layers to that. So although you have so many people like Steve Jobs, that's a turtleneck and you wear sneakers to work, that's not always available to all of us. And that space isn't always available to all of us, although it may be available to our peers. So it, it really is important to not only walk the walk, but to encourage others to show up where they feel comfortable and how they feel comfortable. Going a bit deeper in, into that, I think it's all because of the literature that we've seen around like, the media that we've seen around like, even back in the day with Legally Blonde, right? She mm -hmm. showed up in core Barbie pink, but it is still a suit. 
Yes, it is. But that's the perception. It's like <laughs> you need to rock up in a suit so that people respect you. The color element is great, but it's still a suit. So I love how we start challenging that notions. We have such a diverse background. Our way of conducting ourselves will be different. So it is, I think, about the organizations and how it's being set up to respect that individuality because we doubt that individuality, then we'll have that group thing situation. And I don't think any organizations will appreciate that. I want to go back to two things you mentioned earlier. Now, when you talk about your relationship with your son, I really admire how you say you watch them be brave in their own cause just flipping the table on that. And it, it is my observations. I don't have a kid. I know that parents are a lot more protective these days with the environment, physical and online situation. Within my own families, my parents were extremely protective of myself to a point that I don't feel that they have the trust in me for me to make the right decision for myself. I observe your... Perception towards your son's different. I feel that you have a very strong trust in your son's decisions. Can you share with me how did you come to that trust in him? So similar to you, I know that my parents love me and I'm definitely the most responsible out of my siblings. And I could say that online, <laughs> but it, very similar in that space. I would say that every decision that was made with me growing up, it was a decision either based off of how I needed to show up for my parents and what was being a proper lady. What did that look like? What did that look like for being a, not only proper, respectful, and also really showing up from a space of honor so that your parents could be proud of you? And they never said that they weren't proud, but you were commended on your successes. I skipped a grade. I skipped sixth grade in that space. So I ended up graduating high school at 16. Well, I was always commended for the academic success in that space. So again, it just models a way of this is almost what gets attention. And so I have to continue to show up like this. Otherwise, people may or may not think as highly of me. And whether that was real or not, yeah, I don't even think about that anymore. But when I had my son, like all mothers, you have that great sense of joy. You want them to feel open. You want them to feel secure. You want them to be able to communicate. You also want them to be safe. And a part of safety for me means that you can share anything, whether it's the good, the bad, anything with me. And uh, a, a funny story about that. My son's really tall, was always really tall. He was born at two feet long. So that can give you an idea of, of his growth trajectory. Well, whenever we would have play dates, his peers would always love our house because we never had a rule about you having to ask for snacks. He was always the height where he could go on top of the table and reach the snack. So what we would say is use your best judgment and get a snack. Well, because he had snacks that were available and accessible, he would get a snack at normal times and we didn't have to police it. We didn't have to police the sugar, the snacks, anything in that space. But when his peers came over and they would ask for snacks, it's like, sure, go and get a snack. Yeah, as long as it wasn't something their parents said they could not have. And they were like, oh my gosh, you could just go get one? That, like, this is crazy. But the kids would try to hoard all of the snacks in, in that space. And so my husband and I joked, and even one of our friends, dear friends who has a, a kid that plays with ours, they're like, oh, the free range parenting of snacks. And it became a running joke in our circles. And although that's a very small uh, example, it was the fact that we could trust him to show up. We could ask him, is this the best decision? Do you think that's going to cause you a stomach ache? Is it going to ruin your dinner? Because you do still have to eat your dinner. Uh, <laughs> and he's always shown up with thinking about the decisions he makes. And he's had the autonomy to make those decisions. Of course, with our guidance and 
we always keeping a good eye on him, but having the freedom to express himself, having the freedom to say that he does not like something. Even just yesterday, I, he more or less has had the same hair since he started getting haircuts. Well, I wanted to be the cool mom, which usually when you think you're being the cool mom, you don't actually show up as being the cool mom. I took him to the barber shop and realized that, hey, I don't know anything about haircuts and asked them to give him a neat, clean haircut that all the kids are getting, but that's not too over the top. He got the haircut. He was unsure about it. He said he liked it at first. And then a few hours later, he said that he did not like it. And my response to him, instead of saying, well, you're just going to have to wear it. Well, okay, we can just get it all cut off. But are you open to trying to wear it one day at school? Just try. He said, yes. He wore it. Not that I believe in getting affirmation from your peers, but your peer groups are important and they're key to your growth and development. His peers affirmed him. And then he started talking about how he could express himself more fully, like just, yeah, I, I do like this hairstyle and it's making me feel a bit more like a tween. And again, he's coming up from his own space of how he's affirming himself. So you have to give people space to not only be themselves, but also spaces to mess up and also spaces when you mess up to say, I'm sorry. And this is how I'm open to fixing it or meeting you halfway. And so when I think about my son, just having the humility to sometimes say, yeah, mommy was wrong. I probably wasn't the cool mom. Would you be open in trying something uh, a bit different is how I try to show up uh, for him. I'm still overprotective in some ways. Again, he's very tall. So with that, people think that he's older and it's caused him to be more reserved. So I always want to make sure that at home and anytime that I'm at least with you, that you know that you are perfectly wonderful however you are and however you show up you are wonderful as long as you are treating people well and treating yourself well more importantly the key word that stick through me in that story is that you were able to trust him enough to give him the autonomy to make the decisions and i think in any context in any sort of the relationship building that is the case because we don't take away the choice that they have, we tell them that they actually have a choice to say yes or no. Right. I think it's easier said than done because if we are not in a driver's seat, sometimes it can be intimidating. I really appreciate the autonomy that you give your son and also the people around you. Let's move to that surrounding environment and the network. When you meet someone, how can you tell if you can trust that person? Is there any filter that you use? Is there any questions that you ask? How do you develop the relationship and the trust when you met someone? That's a really hard question. I say it just starts with communication. I believe that you can get a good sense of an individual's vibe, an individual's uh, personality as you engage with them. So you introduce yourself, you all start sharing stories. Uh, sometimes it'll just be surface and they, there's not really much to gain or lose if the conversation remains very surface level. I'm an open book. Most things, I would say 95% of things, you can ask me, I will tell you a straight answer. If it's something that I share and I say, you know, this is confidential, this is personal to me, and I felt comfortable enough sharing with you and it was on my heart to share that with you, I also have to feel comfortable if you decide to go out and share that that it's a loss that I have to be willing to take. It's a vulnerable moment that I have to be willing to take, but I can never grow relationships unless I take risk. And that's how you really build trust. You see that, hey, this person has a perspective. They may judge you and that's a risk. They may choose to continue to associate with you or not, or they may betray your confidence uh, in that space. You will learn, you will adjust and you'll move on. There's a mantra that my coach uh, shared with me. And that is, I am enough, I have enough, I do enough. And a part of that mantra in that space as it relates to building trust, is really that 
I'm okay how I am. And this is my story. This is me. This is what you get. And some of what you get, if you decided to share that, and it was something that was very personal and very deep to me, I can forgive, but I may exercise a different choice the next time I have to engage you about something that's personal. What I found in my life is by starting with the baseline of communication and allowing me to build trust or to even build trust with that individual, it has rarely sent me down a wrong path. Because you get to know the human being, you get to know the person, and you build those layers along the way. So communication is just where I start. That's a good starting point. Was there a time when your trust in a person were tested? Oh, yes. <laughs> That's something that you can share with us? Yes, I can, I can share. Yeah, I can definitely share uh, that with you. When I think about a time where my trust was tested, you know, this is a story that somewhat brings me to tears and brings me great joy at the same time. When I first started my career on one of my first major roles, imagine starting your first day of work. My name is Renika. I've always said my name is Renika. Uh, occasionally, I have used my middle name, which is Nicole. I started work on my first day, my supervisor introduced me to everyone as Niki. It was a name that she came up with, never asked me, never consulted, never considered that I did not like that name and that it wasn't my name and it wasn't okay. She introduced, hi, this is Niki, her position is X, Y, and Z. And I said, hi, my name is Renika. Well, not only was that offensive, in that space, but I was still new. I was still young. I, was, I really didn't know what to do about that. The person that was supervising me proceeded to ask me or tell me, per se, that I was confusing people by saying my name was Renika. So there's so many layers that we can unpack there. But how trust plays a role in this is that I remember coming back to my seat, being hurt, feeling devalued, and not really knowing where to go or what to say after that. And again, I had just started first day on a new job. A gentleman on our IT team walked around and he asked me, what is your name? Because you said one thing and she said something different. And I said, my name is Renika. He's like, well, is Niki your nickname or something? I said, no, I've never heard that name until today. And what he shared with me is he's like, well, before you turn on your computer, I want you to know she's had your email address set up as Nikki. And I have these business cards for you and they're under Nikki. And so now I'm deflated even more. And I just said, I'm going to, you know, suck it up buttercup and just go for it. But then he says something different. He says, well, I can't go against this individual but what I can do for you, because that wasn't right. First saying that it wasn't right affirmed me in that space. And this is a person that I had just met that day. He followed up by saying, I can give you another email address and give you Renika. Just don't send it to her, anything to her as Renika. Everyone in that org recognized what was going on and they called me Renika. They engaged with me as Renika. My email address was Renika to everyone else. Unfortunately, one day, about six months in, I messed up and sent her an email address from Renika. She was disappointed. Everything ended up getting changed to Renika on that day, and we got rid of Niki. But why that impacts me is that someone was willing to stand up in their very own way and show that I'm in alignment with you, that I value you. And he did not know me. He met me 20 minutes beforehand. And he had enough trust in me to say, I'm going to ask the question and I want to help you. And so again, it's very valuable. And I had enough trust to operate in that capacity and to share that, no, this was very uncomfortable and this was my name. And again, very challenging story, but 
I will always be grateful for that because it's shaped the way that I show up for people, the way that if I see something that's going wrong or hear about something that's going wrong, whether it's personally or professionally, why I have the courage to step up and to be that trusted source. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And thank you for explaining all of the emotions that went through at the time as well. So let's say if you went back to that point in time, would you react differently? Yes, I would react differently. And how I would react differently is that for me, I would actually demand that my name is Renika and I need this change to reflect my actual name that my parents gave me. I've been in the workforce long enough to know that you don't have to accept some afflictions. Uh, like you don't have to accept, but it's really abuse in that space. And so, yes, I would have stand, stood up for myself. I, I learned how to do that over time. And again, I would have done it differently. But a part of becoming the person that I am now is experiencing some of those challenges and trusting the process. It might not feel good right now. It may feel horrible. You may have tears going on right now, but it will get you to a better space. And I go back to that mantra, I have enough, I am enough, I do enough. And you have to believe that. And it is a cliche, but trust the process. It will get you to a better place. It will get you to a stronger place. I love that. It's to have a very good sense of strong will in that. So if you have a chance to speak to your younger self at that point in time, what would you tell the younger Ronika? Well, with that situation, I would have said, this is not the place for you. It's okay. You're living at home anyway, so you don't need the job. <laughs> <laughs> Stop trying to be so responsible. I probably would have told her that. But for the younger self, there were so many things that was going on. I would tell the younger Renika that it's okay. Like, it's okay. I am a very type A person. People are like, why well, do you work so hard? I thought that I worked hard just because that was the way that I was taught and raised and because I came from a family with a military background. That's a part of it. But I work hard because I like to challenge myself. I'm not competing against anyone else. I'm competing against myself. And I would have liked to have that self-awareness back then. I also would have loved to tell myself to take care of yourself. A part of most young professionals, especially women, especially women, a part of underrepresented groups, you are driven uh, to uh, achieve. If you are the first in a particular space, you don't want to mess it up for anyone else who may come behind you in that space. You want to create a good environment for them. And those who are working with you uh, on your team, supporting you, you want to create the best environment for them as well. And what I would tell my younger self is that it's okay. And while you're doing that for everyone else, take care of yourself. You can't pour from an empty cup. Take care of yourself. That's the most valuable lesson that I, I could have learned. Also, take time off. There were a few years where I did not take time off. And I loved my job. I loved what I was doing. But you need time for that sacred rest. Like, take care of yourself and trust that it'll be okay if you do. So I really be appreciate nice. that, especially when you mentioned this with women of color, if we are the first in a certain space, all of the sudden we become the representative of our entire whatever space we yeah. represent. And that's such an unspoken, enormous pressure on us for all of the sudden. I mean, I was in situation when I was the only Asian in the boardroom and all of a sudden I am the representative of all Asian. Yes. It's so unfair because I'm just me, right? I'm just me. I can only speak for me and my experiences. Yeah. So let's do a bit more personal, if you are for it. I want to unpack the trust in ourselves. And I can say that you have a lot of trust in yourself, the self-confidence. 
Can you describe the trust in our own self? How does that look? And how could you develop such strong trust in yourself? I'm a work in progress. When it comes to confidence, again, I'm 6'3", and with being taller, uh, as long as you keep your shoulders back, it will exude a bit more confidence in general, just by basis of the height. Walking in this height, walking in the shoes, you portray a lot of confidence. There is self-doubt that I have all the time, every day. Uh, did I do this right? Did I make the right decision? How is this going to impact others and those around me? I try to ask myself this basic question. When I, the doubt starts creeping in, the question is, is that true? So when I think that, is this a bad decision? And, I, and the doubt, is it true? And sometimes it can't be true, what I'm thinking, but also is an alternative true? Because anytime that we make decisions, most people are going to make the best decision or the best decision they can at that time. When it comes to confidence, when it comes to things that could break your confidence, taking a step back and asking, is that true? Usually helps you level set and get rid of, I would call it that inner critic and helps get rid of that doubt that we are our own worst critics in that space. And by really seeking the truth and, and asking yourself the hard truth, that hard question. Uh, a good example is that someone said, oh, uh, which has been said, Renika is intimidating. And if I had pearls on right now, I would clutch them. Me intimidating. Is that true? And, and you could get angry and feel really angry about those types of comments. Is that true? In the sense of, do I go out to intimidate people? No, that is not true. But from someone else's perspective, if I'm very sure with my words, again, my height, something I cannot do anything about it. From your space, it may be. Is it true? And is there a reason to change that? The answer is no. I can't change my height. And I do need to be sure of myself. So I try to ask those questions along the way to make sure that, again, although I'm tall and by tall being tall, I mentioned this a lot because it impacts who I am. I take up a lot of space in the world just naturally. And sometimes the natural inclination can be to shrink and to shrink so that you're not always seen and that you're not always out there loud uh, in, the, in that space. And knowing that it's okay to take up space and you're valued for taking up space and it's okay to be who you are. So that's how I diminish my inner critic and remain true to who I am as a whole. You remind me of how our physical appearance will impact the way we think as well. Growing up in my education system, we were taught to keep our heads down, let the world speak for itself. And the way that I interpreted it is really figuratively keep my head down. And that just diminished so much my self-confidence. So you remind me a lot of that sort of configurative speaking and uh, the way that we portray ourselves. Let's do some creative thinking. Okay. Let's think about a, a dystopian land where trust is not in anyone's vocabulary. So it means there's no trust between individuals. What do you think would happen on that land? The first thing that I, I get a visual uh, of this place, and I see it as being desolate. I see it being either completely destroyed. And by destroyed, I, I mean, I, I visualize like torn down buildings. I visualize like the end of humanity, really, in that space. Without trust, we trust every day, even the people who say that they don't trust. There are certain things that we think about every day that you, you trust that the sun is going to come up. You trust that your the stores are going to open, at least close to the time that they say that they're going to open. They're basic you know, things that no matter where you are, you trust that they are going to happen. But without those basic foundational pieces in place, I don't see a world that could exist. And it doesn't mean that Right now, we're in a space where uh, trust is fully fulfilled, but trust is really on a spectrum. But without it at all, we can't exist. 
I love that. And you remind me that sometimes trust can be something that very minor, something very unnoticeable. I'm taking the train to work. I just have to trust that the train is on time. I just have to trust that the trip will go smoothly. Yeah. I just have to trust that I can read the map so I can walk from the train station to my office correctly. Debatable sometimes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's about all of those little things that we trust in every day that sometimes we don't recognize because they are just so unnoticeable. That's true. That's really cool. We are moving to the last part of the conversation. Thank you so much for staying with me and engaged in the conversations. Um, I'd love to know what's next for you in the coming 12 months. Wow. I should have prepared better. What's next for me in the coming 12 months? Well, first, I'm on a journey of being more intentional. And when I say intentional, it goes back to the time. I like to work, sometimes I overwork and overcommit. So being more intentional about not overcommitting unless it's overcommitting to what I con consider my family of choice, which is my husband and my son. Uh, I wanna make sure that I'm experiencing everything that I can associated with that space because you don't get that time back. I would love to uh, get another certification and not a work certification. I want to get something that is fun. Like I said, a sommelier, a, a, one of my friends wants to do a firearms training just to see and go through that experience. Something along those lines that's completely outside of the box for me is what I want to experience in the next 12 months. Other spaces that I really would love to grow in, I'd love to do more leadership training. I've started this journey in the past 24 months of conducting leadership training, also with helping individuals and small orgs start their own you know, nonprofits in that space. I get so much energy from that and sharing with them that who, what, where, whens, and hows to better their business. I would love to continue down that journey. And also going back to something that I mentioned earlier, that journey of self-care, that journey of taking time off just for me to recharge, just for me to reconnect with friends, as well as to meet new friends. Life is about the relationships that you have and develop and grow over time. And I need to be more intentional about that. It's also I have a lot of things on my list. And that's why I said I should have prepared so I could have organized them a bit better. Another thing that I've been toying around with is a few concepts about writing a book. And so it's been on my mind for a while. I've gotten the affirmation quite a few times, not just from myself, but from those around me. And I think that's a journey I'm interested in going on. Can you share what would the book be about? The book would actually be about uh, experiences in the workplace. Over the last, I'd love to specifically say five to 10 years, uh, my work has either been solely in the space of DEI or has intersected the diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility initiatives. I've heard so many stories from individuals that I think could help impact the greater workforce and the greater good, not just people in the workforce, actually the greater good of humanity. And from someone who was on my team who actually transitioned while in a workplace and some of the challenges that they faced and their perspectives that they had to individuals who again, were the first individuals who graduated from college and went straight through and became a PhD. I've had the privilege of meeting a gentleman who actually was incarcerated in his youth. And he was on a pathway to only being in and out of the criminal justice system. But there was a key moment in his life that shifted things and he ended up becoming a PhD, and he also opened a nonprofit that helped individuals who were incarcerated to become productive citizens and start living out their dreams. So there's so many stories from a perspective 
uh, like that, what I consider a DEI perspective that should be shared, that could have a great impact on people. And I would just love to go down that journey and to write uh, some of them down before I start to forget. I love that. I look forward to seeing the book and, and reading the stories. So amongst those, let's say amongst those goals, what is the one top priority for you? My top priority is being intentional about my family. And I go back to that again. I encourage people to know that whether you are rocking it out of the park right now, or if you're on the verge of either leaving or losing or walking away from your job, you can get the work stuff back. It will be there. Your family, your friends, they're all growing, changing, developing. And that's a journey. That's a piece of the journey you can't go back and get. So again, being intentional about that space is so important to me. And I haven't always been in that space. And now that I am in a space where I can be, I want to devote the time to it. Nice. I love that. Thank you. We're getting to the last question of the episode. If you were going on a dream vacation tomorrow, what is the one item you would take with you? It leaves tomorrow. My dream vacation, the one item. There are two things that pop in my head. <laughs> and this shows a lot about me. My one item would be my cell phone. Okay. And, but the one that's really bothering me that I have to say it out loud is my electric blanket because I don't care if it's hot or cold. I'm always cold. So I have an electric blanket, electric throw, and everyone who knows me would laugh and say, yeah, you would take that <laughs> to the beach with you if you had to. Yeah, I'm always cold too. So yes, my blankets is <laughs> on top of that list. This is the end of the episode. How are you feeling? I'm feeling really good. I'm so appreciative of you, of you for inviting me here, uh, for sharing, to just be open to the story of me. I appreciate it. And I hope that your viewers uh, enjoy the discussion. I love it. I'm biased, but I know my viewer will love it. And I thank you again for your time. That's it for today's episode. Drop your thoughts in the comment section. I'd love to hear your take on the chosen keyword. Have a lovely time and thank you again for spending time with Humans of Authenticity.